You're welcome to Calvary, people, huh? Yeah, see, you got Frosty the Snowman up there. We almost got like the whole white Christmas thing, right? You dreaming of a white Christmas? <laughs> Alora is. I love it. I love it. She's dreaming of a white Christmas. Hey, folks, I want to tell you, last week we gave up these um, Everyday Gospel Christmas devo devotionals, okay? So if, if you did not get one of these, see me by the end of the service. I've been reading through it every day. Paul Tripp's amazing. Great thing. So please get one, if you would. And... Um, just a few announcements for us to make uh, as, as we get said to worship, okay? Just a few announcements. One, hey, we're going to have a potluck afterwards, okay? And now, I, I, I understand this. We're going to have a pot, poor, I know, the poor snowman's getting it. So we're going to have it. We're going to have a song. We're going to have service. We're going to have the Lord's table, and they're going to have a potluck. And it seems like a long time. Now, if you're a Patriots fan, because I know there's some, some still left over, don't worry. They're not going to lose today. It's a bye week. Okay, so don't worry about it. The Patriots will be fine. They'll be fine there. So we're going to have a potluck. It'll be a good time. Hey, folks, we were just in the back of adult Sunday school. The smell coming up the stairs was amazing. So uh, it was amazing. I, I, I'm going to preach real quick. I want to get to it. But, uh, and the other thing, Christmas caroling next Sunday after service. This is a big, big deal, okay? The flyers, these are the flyers that went out. They went to the Dedham Housing, right? They've distributed them twice down there. They're communicating with me down there. Carol, she's not here yet. I hope she'll make it. She said she's talking to people all down there. So we're going to have down there, people are going to come, somewhere between 5 and 50 people. There's the window. And we're going to bring sandwiches. But please, please, I really ask you, really, uh, to set aside anything else. Next week, immediately after service, we'll be down there by 1230. They love to see children. Children, children, children are key. So please remember that. And I want to say one thing here. I'd like to say very important for, uh, to be on a, a prayer list, if you will, okay, is this. Uh, you've seen the prayer request call for that young woman, Kaya. We visited her, Melissa's friend, Kaya, right? Uh, sweet young lady. Marta and I had the opportunity to go in and, and meet her. Her mom, Danielle, uh, is wonderful. She needs a heart transplant, but she's not even on the heart transplant list right now because she's so sick. So I hope to go see her in the next 24 hours again. But folks, her, her condition is critical. She's 5'11". I'm six feet tall, right? I, hundred, I weigh 180 pounds. She weighs 104 pounds. Okay? So think about this sometimes. Just put her in your prayers. Once again, we can think about all these things. Of ourselves. We can be so self-focused, right? Just set some time around and just pray for this young woman. Pray for souls that are out there. This is so important, uh, so important there. But, uh, the, but this morning, you see, Joanna's away, but she recorded a song for us. Isn't that good? So the song, so Joanna's going to be singing background to Kathleen. Isn't that cool? I think this is really, really cool. It really is. So we're going to have a song. So please, please come. Come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Oh, come, oh, come, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here unto the sun.
Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel. Sometimes, you know, we, I think we forget that he is with us. That's what We're going through the day. You're doing what you're doing, right? Whatever's happening. And you're busy, you're hurt, you're tired, you're anxious, you're forgetting. He is with us. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. So that's good. I thank you, Kathleen, for standing in there. And folks, let's do this. Let's greet each other. Say hi. Say wave. You know someone, hug them. I don't care. And then grab a seat. All right? And the children then after that, you can go on down to junior church, okay? So say hi, whatever, grab a seat. Thank you, Kathleen, I got it. Great job. Thank you so much. These little ones are going down. That's a production, huh? That's all right. That's all right. So rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Well, I thank you for being here, folks. Thank you for being here. Once again, I'm Pastor Pete Kane here at Calvary. I'm excited that I get to give God's word. And, and folks, I hope you're excited to receive it. Receive it from me. Receive it when you read God's word, to have God's word in your life. So I titled this message, Dreaming of a White Christmas, right? And so we almost have one, right? We almost have one, okay? I mean, a white Sunday, and it all went away. That's okay. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 1 and 2, so we're not going to read all of Matthew 1 and 2 because that would take up a long time. It really would. But Dreaming of a White Christmas. So that's a song that old Bing Crosby sang, right? This is like a really old song going on there. And I thought about this, kind of sort of silly thought, but it's kind of a 
geographically prejudiced song. We say a white Christmas because we like to have a white Christmas. We're up here in New England and all these things, right? But you know what? Down in the southern hemisphere, it's also Christmas, but it's also summer. So we say a white Christmas. It, it doesn't work down there. They don't have a white Christmas. And many of us here that are living in, 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 that are, that are in the, at Calvary today, you've come from places where you do not have a white Christmas, right? I don't think it happens too often in a lot of countries. Magdala, do you ever have a white Christmas in, in Haiti? No, you did not there. No, you just don't get them in certain places. But uh, so it's a funny thing about that. But, uh, but we like to imagine a white Christmas. I do, OK? Sometimes Christmas, white Christmas will be there, but it gets rained out, huh? When it's a rainy Christmas, isn't it kind of a downer? I mean, it's cold when it rains that time of year. It gets into your bones. That's what it does. But, you know, dreams might not, not actually be real dreams, as in a dream you have. You know, when you're in REM sleep, rapid eye movement, that's when you dream, right? All those crazy things go through your mind. That's not that. But sometimes it's just thinking about the things that we want, the things we dream about. And what we want, by definition, is leaving God out of the equation, if you think about it, right? What I want leaves God out of the, the equation. What does God want? Something to think about, right? Dreaming of this white Christmas. Now, we make plans, we dream, and often things don't work out according to our plans, right? That's true without your ambitions. You might want to be an X, Y, or Z, but it just doesn't come about, right? It might be that you plan to marry your mate, and they're going to be X, Y, and Z. Then you find out that they're not. I mean, that happened to me. Did you know that? Do you know the, tri the trial I had to go through? I thought my wife's family was rich. I thought, I mean, her, her dad was in IT years ago. I thought she was rich. I thought I was getting the money. He wasn't. He wasn't rich. I had to really tough it out. And she got what she wanted, because she's looking for a guy that had a car, and I had a car. So she made out, and I didn't. It's just so hard. This, is, this has been a saga for almost 42 years, folks. And I'm not over it, I'm not over it. But, uh, and you might have dreams for your children, too. And they don't turn out the way you want it to, right? It's a funny thing as you go through life. That'll happen. But imagine if every parent's dream was that their children would just do the will of God. Look at the will of God. Doesn't that sound wonderful? It could really be scary. Step back and think about it. Your child's doing the will of God, so all of a sudden they're going to be a missionary. All of a sudden, your baby boy, your baby girl, goes off to some nice place like Somalia or Yemen, right? Somalia in Africa, I think, it, I think it's like a rule. They constantly have a civil war over there. Yemen, I don't think Christians are, are, are invited over there too much. How about your child, in the will of God, decides, Mom, Dad, I'm going to find a way to go be a missionary to North Korea. Okay, we have people that have been here before uh, 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 that, that, that did just that very thing, sort of sneaking in to North Korea. That's putting your life on the line. So being in the will of God is so important for us. If your children are in the will of God, I want you to think of something else about this. They're going to consciously rely on God all the time. What do you mean, Pete? Consciously rely on God. So do I consciously rely on God for food? Nope. I know we have a potluck downstairs. There's going to be plenty of food. I'm not worried about the meal tonight, tomorrow, the next day. Now, I pray about my meals, but I'm not consciously relying on God for that. It's a funny thing, but think about it. When's the last time you've really consciously, I hope I get my next meal. But if you are truly in the will of God, he might put you into a place where you have to truly be depending on him. We don't. We have so much. It really is. Our concern level gets lowered at times because we have so much. But having said that, dreaming of the white Christmas, let's have a word of prayer as we get into this message, because I could really get into it. But uh, Father, I thank you for those that are here today, Lord. We have all of our dreams and aspirations, Father. But as we go through this, Lord, we look at your text about this Christmas story, that we would understand your will in our life, Father, your will in our lives. Convict our hearts about your will in our lives today, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, dreamers, okay, in the Old Testament, we have some dreamers. We had a dreamer by the name of Joseph. Do you remember Joseph in the Old Testament? Okay. He was Jacob's favorite son. He was daddy's boy. Mm. You always want to be daddy's boy, right? He was a favorite, right? Being daddy's boy made him his brother's punching bag, I bet, right? The daddy's boy, they didn't like him probably too much. Okay, they didn't like him at all. They had him for little brother. 
There's a funny thing about Joseph, this dreamer. Joseph had these dreams, if you recall, and he only saw good things in his dreams. He saw himself there, and he saw his brothers and his fathers bowing down before him. Not a good look, okay? His brothers really had it in for him after that, if you know the whole story, if you go through and read it, right? He's going that. So, but what happened in Joseph's life, he's had this, this a white Christmas dream, if you will, right? But it turned pretty rainy pretty quick. Right? If he goes off, he's, he's falsely accused of things. He's imprisoned. All these things happen to Joseph. And probably what he's saying to himself, that's not what was in my dream I had. I didn't, that wasn't my dream at all. They were bowing down before me. Now I'm in prison. Joseph's dream got rained on pretty hard, didn't it? Not a white Christmas. But we have this other Joseph in the New Testament. Joseph, Mary's husband, Jesus' stepfather. Stepfather. When you read the Bible, Think of the actual relationships of what's going on in there. It's really important. Sometimes we read the Christmas story. You know, we hear people say, I know the Christmas story. It's da 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 Let's go to lunch. You need to see it as it really is, okay? The Christmas story, what was going on there. So Joseph has four dreams, four dreams in Matthew 1 and 2. It's crazy. Think about this. Dreams are all through the Bible. We talked about this on a Thursday night a month or two ago. There's dreams all through the Bible. Something you say, you say, oh, that's silly, there's dreams. They're all through the Bible, folks, and Joseph had four of them regarding the birth of Jesus Christ, okay? But Joseph's dreams were not like the American dream. You know we say the American dream? And I had to write it down for a definition because I couldn't get it straight. The ideal that the United States is a land of opportunity that allows possibility of upward mobility, freedom, and equality for all people of all classes who work hard and have the will to succeed. Now, I like it. Don't you like that? I mean, I honestly do like it. But you knew there was a but coming, right? There always is. There always is. Is God at the heart of that dream? He's not. Everything I just said sounds good. But God is not at the heart of that dream. He is not, OK? That dream is all about me, if you think about it. I'm not saying it's a bad dream. But God's not in that dream. I, I'm all for upper mobility. I'm all for prosperity. I'm all for freedom. Absolutely, OK? I hope you're very prosperous. I honestly, I've said, you've heard me say this, I hope you make millions of dollars. If you have a talent, use it. You make millions of dollars, that's great. Just be sure you give an offering to God, thanking him for that ability he gave you. I don't need it, I don't need it. But God wants that back with much more. Some people have been given the ability to make money and that's their gift to do things. That's fine, that's all these things. But does the dream, this American dream or any dream we have, does it come between a person and God? That's something to be thinking about, isn't it? And the American dream doesn't happen in our sleep. No, it's a conscious thing that's going on in our mind. And the American dream controls our actions. It really does. But the dreams that Joseph had was while he was in his sleep. And they did control his actions as we look at them. It really did. But Joseph's actions were under the control of God when he had them. But even with the goodness of the American dream, I think we need to question today, what is the source of our dreams? What's the source of your dreams? The things that we're aspiring to do. It's so important for us to think of that. Joseph had a dream about his dream girl, Mary, right? There he is in Nazareth. He's got his hometown girl. I mean, he was in love with her, no doubt. He was. As we go through the story, you, you see that he actually was. He had a dream about her. But his dream about white Christmas, happily ever after with Mary, right? It becomes a rainy day real quick, real quick. So let's take a look at these four dreams that Joseph had. So I'm going to have a lot of scripture up here because I'm saying a lot of words. But you need to see God's word when we're, doing, when we're going through the word of God. It's important for us. In his first dream, it says in Matthew, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found the child of the Holy Spirit. Then her... Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to put her in it, not wanting to make a public example of her, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the, is of her, is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of 
by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, as we just sang, God is with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary to his, uh, from his wife and did not know her till she brought forth the firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. If you really think about that, it's a lot in those verses, but we're only looking at the dream part of it. I don't know it's in dreams today, okay? Because in Joseph's dream, he got the full story, didn't he? And it wasn't the American dream. It was an ideal of prosperity, okay? Things were going to get pretty rough for him. I want you to think about this. As you think of that dream, Mary had already had the hard conversation with Joseph. I'm pregnant. Whoa. Think about that. A hard conversation to have. Joseph didn't speak a word. He got up and did exactly as the angel commanded. That's something to be said to being obedient, isn't it? But Joseph's white Christmas, right? Happy marriage to Mary. It's getting rained on pretty hard at this time, isn't it? Like, this is the girl I'm going to marry. She's pregnant. And they're in Nazareth. This isn't a big town. Who's the, who's the father, right? Just be, just be honest. Just be honest. Look at this in context when we read it, right? But God chose Joseph, a man of character. And I'd like us to keep that in mind. Our character matters to God. Godly character displays God in a person's life. It does. You can't fake it for long, folks. You can pull the whole thing, a holy roller thing for a while, but sooner or later, it's going to come out. You cannot fake godly character. It will come out sooner or later. It always does. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take, uh, take to you Mary for your wife, for that, which is, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. No fear again, right? Remember when Mary was told by the angel Gabriel, that she was going to be of the Holy Spirit, he said, fear not. Fear not. This is, and Joseph gets the same message. Fear not. Fear is a big, big, big deal, folks. It really is. Fear is the opposite of love. It's not hate. You think of things, I think of hate as like an organ of fear, like it's liver, it's kidney. But fear is the opposite of love. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has been not, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. That's an important, an important verse for us to take in place. What fear does to us. Fear leaves us in torment. It really will. Perfect love casts out fear. This is what was happening with Mary and Joseph, right? He had to learn not to be concerned about what the world and people's opinions would be in this, right? Take Mary as a wife. God's love extinguishes fear. It really does. Now, clearly he loved her, remember, because he was thinking to privately put her away, right, because of her pregnancy, before he was visited by God. That's a pretty cool thing, right? This is a man of integrity. You can tell that he truly loved her. He was not going to make a, a spectacle of her to preserve his integrity. It was not going to happen. He's a man of this. In Joseph's dream, okay, he learned not to fear the world. People are in bondage because of fear of one another. We are in fear of one another. It's an amazing thing that happens. Judging one another happens all the time, doesn't it? People are judging one another. Just so you know, I know this is a good broadcast, I, I, I don't care. This week I had to deal with people regarding the pantry judging one another because of something that went on in the pantry, believe it or not. I've never had to do this, what, it's been, what, four years? People were on, imagine this, social media, judging one another, calling one another, going back and forth. People whose names are in this town that are, that are known around the town, I'm saying, really? That's what you're going to do? About a pantry? Isn't that kind of wild? We judge one another. We should not be judging one another. Don't do this. People go around. We're not to be bound up in, in the fear of people and their opinions. Because people's opinions are a product of them walking in the dark until they walk in the light. Because until you walk in the light, you're going to have some dark opinions. 
It's funny, before I became, I think back to how I used to think of people before I became a Christian. That's a piece of work. <laughs> I was a piece of work, what I would think of people. I mean, I could run down the whole list when I saw people. I run through your education, your ethnicity, da, 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 the whole things. <sighs> what a ridiculous way to be, judging people that way. It really is. People's opinions and judgments will be silly and savage. Savage. Think of Mary's pregnancy today, right? If she wanted to abort the baby, in the opinion of the world, go for it, girl. That is savage. If she was in this day and age, it's an amazing thought. We need to fear God and fear God's judgment. Remember, trusting in God. Remember, I love it. Go back and read it. If you get, read again the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's such a great, great, great account. They get put into the fiery furnace, right? Okay? I imagine it was some fear that I don't misunderstand me. But God did not extinguish the flames. There was four figures in the flame, right? Do you remember the story? No, he was with them in the flame. Emmanuel, God with us. He was with them in the flame. We need to keep this in our mind. We are going to go into fiery places. It's going to get hurt. You feel like you're going to get burned. Is God with you or not? He is. Do we remember this? when we're getting burned, and we get burned at times. So the message to Joseph from this first dream was, you got this, it's okay. And he says, wake up, take care of your girl, right? That's, a, that's effective what the angel was saying. You know, suck it up, buttercup, get to it. Take care of this, you have a job to do, and you aren't equipped to do it, I get it, but just get going, I'll take care of this. This is what the angel was telling him. Then we move on to his second dream. His second dream, well, get ahead of myself. Joseph's second dream, it didn't turn out real good for Joe in his second dream as well as he planned, right? Because he was descendant of David, so he had to travel from, from Galilee down to, down to Bethlehem, right? To his place of lineage, where he comes from, okay? Because that tax they had to pay. It's interesting to think these. Why this tax at this time? It's all God's planning. You've got to stop that. It's God's planning. It wasn't in line with certain historical things that the taxation that took place. Yeah, I know, because it was of God. That's why. And he goes back to his family's place of origin, but it provided no safety to him. The events that happen there, Jesus is born. On the eighth day, he's circumcised. On the 40th or 41st day, depending on how you want to count it, he was presented at the temple, right? That was the process that went on there. And while they're in Bethlehem, the magi, the wise men come. They came to worship the king of the Jews. They go to see Herod, and they say, we've come to worship the king of the Jews. And it's a big question whether Herod was a Jew or not. You know, this, all these things. You know, we, we put labels on people sometimes. I don't know. I don't know. How could, you know, uh, these things. But they came from the east. Were they Jewish? They came to worship the king. Of, think of this. They came to worship the king of the Jews. Were they Jewish? Because they came from the east, right? Did they come from present day? Go to the east of Bethlehem, right? Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, or China. It doesn't say, does it? Look at the Bible, read it sometimes, and let your mind open up a little bit. We don't know how far they came. Last week I spoke of the Ethiopian eunuch. He came from 1,500 miles to the south, from Ethiopia, up to J Jerusalem to worship. Was he a Jew? We don't know. Does it matter? I don't think that it does, but it's accounted there for us. It's an amazing thing when we're motivated to worship, folks. All the obstacles that are in the world will get removed. When you're motivated to worship, you will do this. When you're motivated to serve, something else gets pushed out of the way. That's just what happens. Distance and obstacles, they become not very important. And of course, King Herod, hearing that the king of the Jews was being born, he saw competition. That's what he saw. He had in his mind to kill Jesus. That's what he did. Now when they had departed, that's the, the, the Magi, after they've departed, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, remember, he said, always going along. God's in control, telling Joseph what to do. Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother and they departed by night, they departed by night, they, they, and the mother by night and departed to Egypt. They took off. And this is not a trivial thing, folks. There's your little map, the red line. It's going from Bethlehem down to Egypt. They're going to cross Sinai. This is a long, this is two or 300 miles. 
The green line is later on when they come back all the way up to Galilee. They were listening to God. This is hard stuff, okay? This isn't getting up early enough to come to church, okay? This is a hard journey. It really is, okay? They had no SUVs, okay? They didn't even have camels. They didn't have any of those things when you look at it. So the timeline, we look at this. The evidence about it, this being about two years after, once again, that, 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 uh, that, that Jesus was born is simply because Herod ordered the death of all the male children two years and younger, younger, right? There's no exact number to where when the Magi came and left. Don't get hung up in that. Just look at the storyline, what's going along with it. It's so important for us to do that. But when the Magi departed, Joseph did what he's supposed to be told to flee. So remember the relationship. You have Jerusalem here, and you have Bethlehem here. This is close. They had to leave immediately. Imagine that being told this afternoon, you need to leave, go right now. Grab your wife, grab your child, and just go at night. That's, it's amazing. Think of the context these people had to live in and how hard it was for them to do this. Things have gone bad in Bethlehem. Bethlehem becomes a slaughterhouse. Herod's going to murder those baby boys, right? It's horrific. It's beyond our imagination. But this is the reality of the human heart unfettered. I think God records these horrific things to remind us how dark our hearts can really get. You say, oh, this couldn't happen now. Really? Yeah. Things like this happen now, today. We're insulated from it. We truly are. So Joseph's dream of living in the town of his heritage, right, maybe down there in Bethlehem, all right, it's no white Christmas. The rain came, and it washed it out. And imagine their hardship going to Egypt. They're not Egyptian. It's a long journey. It's a place where the Jews were in bondage for 400 years. Were there any memories about this, right? What's important is that they were out of the reach of Herod, right? They're out of reach of Herod. God will put us in places where we don't want to be for his reasons. God will put us in places where we don't want to be for his reasons. It might be for protection. You need to be protected. Perhaps you need to provide direction. Perhaps you need to be a light to someone. God will put you someplace that you don't want to be. Because when a believer goes into a dark place, you're a light. When, I, I'm going to keep telling you this until everyone says, when this, I'm a light. I'm going to get this. When a believer goes into a dark, you're a light. We need to remember this. We need to act on this. It's so important for us. It really is. Okay? It really is. In Matthew 5, verse 15, nor, they, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it will give light to all who are in the house. When you go into a dark place, you will give light to whoever's in the room. You will. Let your light shine so before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Don't be afraid of the dark. Be a light. And a little small point, okay, just a little thing, but, you know, we go through this. The Magi, right, when did they get there? Clearly they were not at the, at the nativity scene, right? I know we all have nativity scenes. Light's going to set up his today, this afternoon in his house, and he's probably going to have the, the wise men there, right? Light, you're not a heretic. You're just confused. But seriously, they weren't there because remember when, Mary and Joseph, when they went to the temple to present Jesus, they gave the low-budget sacrifice, didn't they? Two turtle doves. I'm on a low budget. That was for the poor people, right? Had the Magi been there with them beforehand? Remember they had frankincense and, and, and gold? They would have had to give a, a big offering. It's just a little point. Folks, when I read the Bible, I love finding all these little tiny things in there that tell us something more about the story in details. It's so important there. It's just my little things. Now, the third dream, the coast is clear. The coast is clear. Now, when Herod was dead, now that's a horrible way to get into, you know, oh, the coast is clear, right? Someone's dead, right? But Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph, saying, uh, Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother, and they came to the land of Israel. It sounds like a good plan, right? I doubt their lifestyle in Egypt was what they really wanted, right? Don't you wonder what the relationship would have been between Egyptians and Jews at that time? Think of ethnic ethnicities that go on between people. 
Don't just read this as a little story. These are real people interacting with other people, okay? It's been centuries since, the, since, uh, since God had passed judgment on Egypt and released Israel, but it, it was there. And even in today, right? Today, between Egypt and Israel, they're not at war. But boy, I don't think they're cozy. There's a big wall of separation. These things go on. This is centuries later, folks, like 2,000 years, 2,000 years. But the thought of going home to Israel would have been pretty cool. Sounds great. You're going back to your people, your customs, your way of worship, your food. Isn't it good to get back to the food you like? I, I, I love it. I, I just love it. We're going to have a potluck later. I'm going to love it because I like the food we have. Your people bring all kinds of food, and I love all kinds of food. But then we get to his fourth dream, his fourth dream. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father, he was afraid to go there. He's afraid to go back to this place. And being warned by God in a dream, again, fourth dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. He shall be called a Nazarene. So he's back in his hometown. That's where Mary and Joseph met. An, ex an obscure place of no reputation, right? It's so funny. You know, I think of you when you grow up and stuff. I grew up out in Ashland, uh, you know, a little bit west of here. It's, if you grew up, we used to call it trash land. That's what we called it. It was trash land. That's what it was, right? And, and it was of no reputation. Now, I mean, people think it's a big deal to live in Ashland. It's just so funny the way things change. Oh, you live in Ashland? Yeah, I grew up in trash land. It's just so funny at any rate. But we're told during our Lord's time, it's estimated by archaeologists, that it was probably less than 20 families living in this town of Nazareth. It was an unimportant, crude kind of place. That's why Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth, right? And that, uh, right? That's what he said. In the irony of that, immediately after he says that, Jesus says, hey, Nathaniel, follow me. I'm from Nazareth. I just love that kind of stuff when it happens. It just happens. Go to Nazareth. You're both from there, right? They were both from Nazareth. Your family's there. You've not seen your family. They haven't seen their family for years. You know what? Their parents have not seen their grandson, Jesus. You ever think about that? Jesus had grandparents. It's kind of wild when you think about it, isn't it? It just is. I know people get all bent out of shape about that from theological things. You get, get over it. Just look at the lineage. People get, love to get upset about things. Maybe I love upsetting them. I don't know. But at any rate, at any rate, go there. But we have dreams too. And dreams ebb and flow, just like Joseph's do. Sometimes it rains on our dreams and they just get washed out. It hurts, huh? Folks, it's okay to hurt sometimes. Your dreams get washed out. They just do. But the reason for the rains is because God rains. Don't we make the English language difficult? Rains and rains. How do people learn this language that I speak? I look out, I know, I, I, that's why I love Calvary, because we have such a, a smorgasbord of people and stuff here. You know, how can someone learn this language from China, right? From Haiti, from, from Belarus, you know? How can you, it rains and it rains, really? But God rains, that's why it all happens. In Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. You know, sometimes you might think that God's giving us a bad time. And that's what we'll do, right? But remember what I said earlier in Matthew. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord through the prophets. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Revealed to Joseph was this, that it might be fulfilled. Mary being found with a child because God reigns. God reigns. It's so important to remember that. And God's reign is not a rainy day. It's a wonderful day. God's reign is why all this is happening. Something much bigger than Mary and Joseph's dream. It really was. When it seems that your dreams are 
not being filled, they're being fulfilled. God's part is taking place. God's script and plan are overshadowing your plans. Think about it. Sometimes we say, things just aren't working out. Are you sure? Are you sure they're not working out? Because God is working his script. Perhaps the things we think are not working out is because God is not allowing those things to work out, not our plans. Because God says something else for you. Doors will be shut to us. It may seem like things simply aren't working out. I understand that. But if we pay attention, we'll see his hand moving. In fact, if we're very attentive, what we, what we dream, if we stay close to God, we will have our dreams be his will. Be his will. Wouldn't it be wonderful if your dreams were the will of God? It requires a changing of our minds. It really does. But that's where our dreams belong. That's what really do. You're dreaming of a bigger house? That's nice. You're going to have to clean it. You're going to have to heat it. That's all great. But how are we doing with the homes that God has given us? There was no room at the inn. And Joseph showing up was family. He wasn't even a stranger, was he, right? He was of the house of David. Tell me, have you recently cared for strangers in your home? Think about this for a minute. Throughout the Bible, called to care for strangers. It's a scary thing for us, isn't it? Invite a stranger into our home. Caring for strangers is all over the Bible. I bet Joseph and Mary were someone would have willingly given up a bed in the house so she could have given birth to Jesus in a room where there were no animals. Not a big thing, huh? Think about that. What do you dream for? What do you dream for? What provoked you to dream what you dream? What is the motivation of your dreams? That's something we need to really think about. There's four dreams in the birth of Jesus. And they weren't necessarily what Joseph would have dreamt at all, was it? No, his dream girl, he was thinking, what was happening to him? But let's just close with talk about Joseph just for a minute because he's such a great character in the Bible. Remember what it said about Joseph. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not one to make a public example of her, was minded to put away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. The three things about Joseph is the first and foremost, he was a just man. He was a just man. That means he's justified before God by faith. They mean God took away his sins, past, present, and future. That might be a hard concept for us to grasp, but I still sin. I get it but my trust is in Jesus Christ. He was justified, just as he had never sinned before. And he was a gentle man. He was willing to put Mary away secretly before the Lord spoke to him. Do you realize how profound that is? What this man's heart must have been like? He didn't preserve himself. He wasn't worried about his reputation. He was worried about this woman that he loved. He's thinking that she messed up, but he still loved her. He could have made a public example of her. He knew the law, but he understood the law. He understood the mercy that was in the law, and he showed mercy on her. He did to her exactly what he would want to have done to him that he sinned, right? There's mercy. That's what's about, and that is what he did. It's an amazing thing, and he was a thoughtful man. Folks, I want to say this. Take time to think. Do we think? Do we take time to think things through, our actions and what we're doing? We really need to. He was a thoughtful man. He thought this all through. And while he's thinking it through, and even his dream, God comes to him. So, when God disrupts your dreams, he's probably doing so to give you something better, something different, something in line with his plans. What we simply need to do is yield to the script that God has for us, okay? Because what happened in these, to Mary and Joseph was not at all in their script, was it? That was not what they planned. No one plans to get married and have all those things happen to them. But they yielded. They were not fearful because perfect love casts out fear. As we go to the Christmas season, please remember, perfect love casts out fear. Father, I thank you for this, 
this time, Lord, that we can look at your word for your goodness to us. Father, help our dreams and aspirations to be chasing after what you would have us to do, Lord. Change in our hearts and let our will be your will, Father. You're so good to us, in spite of us, Lord. Father, you saved us in our sins, past, present, and future are forgiven. It's something we can't even understand. We can only praise you for it, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right.